we are so grateful for his faithfulness. We have been on a journey this month, and I want to thank God for what he started doing among us. Last week, Pastor was talking to us about perspectives, and you left this place and you start asking yourself, what glasses have you been using? <laughs> because the glasses that you use will determine what you see. And the, the glasses is our perspective. But this morning, the Lord gave me a word that I want to share with us to encourage us. And that's endurance in the face of adversity. So as I was thinking about what is it, because you know there's so much things that come into your spirit, but you want to pinpoint what it is that the Lord wants to say. There are many, many, many scriptures, but something that dropped in my spirit this morning was the account of the, the man Job. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me to the book of Job. We will go through them with our certain points, key points that I want to take out. Um, verse 1 said, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also he had possessions, also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses. Each one is appointed there and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the day of feasting had run their cause that Job would send and sanctify them and he would raise early, rise early in the morning and offer bond offering according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. Thus Job did regularly. And may the Lord bless the reading of his words. Amen. The account that we've just read just now just gave us a preview of the lifestyle of Job. Very interesting, showing us how great he was, how rich he was, he had a family, Things were fine. He was named as one of the greatest men in those times. And it's so interesting that when everything was going fine, even at that time, Job was still believing God that I don't want my... He wasn't thinking about himself per se. He was thinking more about, I just don't want my children to mess up. Just like any parent would do. I don't want my, any of my children to mess up. So the, the, God gave us an account of this. And when you look through this, I see us as individuals in this. I see us in different facets of Job's life and in different places. We say, well, I'm not rich to that, but you have something that is dear to you. Amen? All of us have got things that are dear to us. All of us have got things that where we are now today, if there's a shaking and we lose any of those things, we ourselves will begin to ask questions. So the picture was painted for us in those first five or so verses about Job and what he was doing and his life. So it gives us a backdrop of the reality of what was happening. Now what I want you not to fail to see is that what was happening was what you naturally see physically that was happening. So Job, when all that was said was what you can see. If you go to Job's house, you will see his five sons and three daughters. If you go to Job's house, you'll count the number of people in that. You can actually physically count them. You can actually see them with your eyes because those are physical things. However, while these physical things were going on, things was happening in the spirit realm that was unbeknown to Job. Just like our lives, things are going on in the spirit realm that is unbeknown to us because we don't know what is happening. But what we see, we are seeing the natural things and we use the natural things to begin to judge ourselves. This morning, God is opening our eyes to get a better understanding. You know, last week we talked about perspective. That the natural things that you're seeing doesn't end there. There are things that control the natural things. 
And if you look at verse 6, we start the roll call of what was happening in the spirit realm. I like the way the Bible put things. Gives you what was happening in the natural realm, what you can see, what you can touch, what you can taste, what you can be able to uh, um, understand with your eyes. And, and those things God gave us to see. And then he came all the way to the sixth verse. And from the sixth verse, we started to see some, what we will call down on earth, some anomaly. Some things that doesn't quite fit the picture. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to, pre to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also come along among them. And the Lord said to Satan, where do you come? From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. I want to stop there. Peter told you that you have an adversary. Amen. That goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy. So there he is telling you his assignment. Going back and forth. Then the Lord said in verse 7, in verse 8, to Satan, Have you considered, God, why me? Why not you? You just, just, look at, just look at it. I want you to understand that there were other people on earth. If you don't believe there were other people on earth, go back to the first five verses. He said he had a big household. So there are other people apart from Job that were living. Job had a wife. There are other people. God could have chosen anybody. Amen. But it's not about anybody. It's about assignment. Look at your neighbor. So it's about assignment. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth? What a testimony. A blameless man, an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So because, because he fears God, because he wants to serve God, because he wants to walk for God, because he wants to be holy, because he wants to stand above the nonsense of the earth, because he wants to do that, that's why the enemy came against him. If he was part of his ranks, he would not go against him because he already had him in his, in his latch. But he is not. So his testimony was that he fears God. So all the attack was, let's see to what extent he fears God. Let's see to what extent he has chosen him. Let's see to what extent, when, when, let me see if some things happen to him, if he will still fear God. Is that not what we are going through in life? When you became a Christian, he said to yourself, why am I going through this? Why? So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, number one, around his household, number two, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely Cause you to your face. When I was looking at this, I began to see the attack started. It didn't start with outside. It started with the things that dared to him. Look at what he said. Not only have you blessed, he said you have hedged him around. You have, you have made a hedge around him. You have made a head around his household. You have made a head around all that he has on every side. You have hedged him, his household, and what belongs to him. Everything. That is how you are with God. Let me say that again because you, you might not understand. What is happening in heaven is a clear indication of who you are and where you are. God has a hedge around you. God has a hedge around your household. And God has a hedge around everything that you have. Amen. He has a hedge because, listen, we have a better covenant. We have a better covenant. 
And it also said that you bless the works of his hand and his possession has increased. Why? Every increase is coming from the Lord. Amen. But then he said, but now stretch out your hand and touch him. Or touch all that he has and it will surely cause you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay hand on his person. Let me say this to you. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. There is a limit to what the enemy can do to you. I said there is a limit to what the enemy can do to you. He is not permitted to do what he feels like. He's not permitted. He doesn't have the authority. He's not permitted. He is permitted to do what God allows to happen. And what God allows to happen is what God knows because God knows your capacity. He knows you are able to go through it. For that's what the Bible says. It will not allow you to be tested beyond what you are able to bear. So anything that the enemy throws on you is what God knows. He can handle it. His testimony about it has not changed. And I want you to look at, this was what got my attention from verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother. Uh, why, why was it on the day that they're in the oldest brother's house? <laughs> why not the middle brother or the last brother? For some reason, I, I pick on little things that, you know, I'm, I'm just, I ask questions. It's good to ask questions. So why? Why the oldest brother's house? Uh, if, if it's the oldest brother, you know, maybe sometimes when, when there's this party going on, you might say, oh, brother, I'm a little bit busy today. But when the oldest brother calls, you just, oh, well, you know, if we don't go now, he would say, so let us all go. Hmm. And this is me saying, the Bible didn't say that, please. And the messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servant with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, the, fear, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servant and consumed them, and I alone have uh, uh, escaped to tell you. I keep asking myself, why is it there is always somebody that will escape to come and tell the story? Th that's the wickedness of the enemy. So while he was still speaking, another came and said, the, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the commons, and took them away, yes, and killed the servant with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest, uh -huh, oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone escaped. To tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped <laughs> and said, Naked have I come from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord took it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. I want you to sit down, and I'm going to just show you the Strategic breakdown of the attack of the enemy. Did you notice that he didn't go first for the children? He strategically took the things that he has first. Took the things that he had in, 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 in different sections. So when one is finishing, the other one is coming to say this. When want, that one is finishing, strategically. So when the enemy comes against us, first of all, come maybe steal our finance. As if that's not enough. Still our children. As if that is not enough. Then they come to our health. So strategically, the enemy would take. Because he knows there are some things that you can recover from. But you can imagine how Job felt when everything that he had is lost. And the Bible said that he praised God. He recognized that he had nothing in this world. And he recognized that everything he had was given to him by God. So his mind, his soul, his spirit, and his being was not tied to those things. Hallelujah, somebody. 
His life was not tied to those things. He understood that those things that were taken, they can be replaced by God as long as he stays faithful to God. You would have thought by now that the guy would have just left him and said no. Chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came around uh, among them to present himself before the Lord. I don't know what for, but... And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you got... <laughs> I want you to look at your neighbor. Look at them squarely in the eyes and tell them, may your testimony that God has for you not change. I, 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 did God change his, 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 his thoughts about Job? No, 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 no. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job and there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns, and, and shuns evil. I like the old King James say, it's true evil, amen. And still, and, and still he holds fast to his integrity. God did not discount what was happening. He didn't play like it was not happening. Because you know sometimes when we hear the testimony, we think that God has forgotten what was happening or what has happened to Job. No, God didn't discount it to say that it was not. No, he said, and still he hold fast to his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Now, can you just see? I want you to understand the strategic. Because it looked like, okay, if I take his stuff from him, he can still make another one. Then he made a statement that should get all of us as believers to think. He said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. So but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and flesh and it will surely cause you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a pot's head with which he scraped himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Now it's all right if I'm going through my stuff, okay? I've lost my family. I've lost my children. I've lost everything that we used to have. All the, the nice cars, going out on holidays, and all those things. We don't do them anymore. And then here's my wife. And the wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. You know, oftentimes people look at that and start saying, Job's wife, why would Job's wife be, do, be doing this kind of thing? I need you to, uh, you remember when we started, I gave you a, a, a preview to say what was happening on earth and what was happening in heaven, okay? So do you think that Job's wife just got those words at random? Oh, please, please, come on. Do you think, it, I mean, exact words? At random? Could it, could it be that that was given to her by somebody? Could it be that she was accessed, Malabrokos Kandia? She was accessed by demonic forces to cause her to hear and started to speak. Could it be that she was used as a conduit of the enemy? Could it be? Why would the first thing you say is, Curse God and die. Come on. You are my husband. What I should be doing is thinking how I should pray and get you to be well. And you tell him, curse God and die. You know, two things is here. One, as a wife, be careful what you say. And not just a wife, as partners, husband, children, whoever. Be careful what you say. Weigh your words. Because the Bible said that 
out of the heart proceeds some words. I mean, the treasure that comes out of our, our mouth is what we've already had in our heart. It's so important that we understand because if you don't, if you could have read this thing before and you don't, but hang on a second. Why didn't you say hang in there, Hussie? Honey, God will do it. You know how we got here. Hold on. God that brought you this far will take us through. Why not? But the thing you say, uh, if first of all, you say, do you still hold fast to your integrity? I find it very, very interesting. When you go to, I want to read verse 3 so that you know where she got it from. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you conceived my, my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless man, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity? He holds fast to his integrity. So God, listen, God spoke that to Satan. Clearly, God did not speak to the, this woman, the wife, because if the wife knew that that's what God said about Job, she would not make that statement because she would say, I know that God is going to do something because I heard him say things about you. No, 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 no. Who was speaking? The message was brought by somebody else and caused her to speak it the way she did. And you know what he said? He said, why don't you cause God to die? And I'm thinking to myself, why would you want me to cause God and die? What would happen to you? So you are not bothered about being married then. Now I want to just look at the, I want to isolate Job's wife before we look at what Job did. I want to isolate Job's wife because we have people among us that will give us advice that is not necessarily God's advice. It might be out of her frustration, but out of your frustration, go to God. Mind what you're saying. Because as far as Job's wife was concerned, you are as good as dead. That's, that's the whole truth. You are as good as dead. And the first thing that the enemy attacked was what God was... You see, your testimony is what the enemy is trying to attack. God said, he's a man of... He holds on to his integrity. The wife said, do you still hold on to your integrity? Why don't you curse God and die? Is it a crime for me to hold on to my integrity? Or is it because you believe that you're not getting what you used to get? But listen to Job's response. What he said to her, you speak as one of the... <laughs> You speak as one of those foolish women speaks. <laughs> we don't have foolish women here. Say amen. amen. We don't have foolish women here. <laughs> it's, you speak as one of those foolish women. I can imagine, uh, please, you know, you get some imagination. Get some imagination, okay? So, Job is going through all this thing, scrubbing himself, in pain and all this thing, and the woman come and tell her, he just turned you, turned her. What is, this is English now. That was, in those days, you speak like this. What is wrong with you? Are you, are you correct up there? You're talking like a, like a fool. Basically, that's what it's not, what's wrong with you? He was not, he was thinking that. Are you the one going through it? It's my body. I'm the one that's supposed to be crying that God, kill me, kill me. You, what is wrong with you? 
What is your issue? Deal with your issue first. And he said, you speak like one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Endurance in the face of adversity. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Beloved, it is what you say with your lips is what's in your heart. Turn with me to Psalm 91. Job did not sin with his lips. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Why would I say that? Because of the, where I'm abiding. So as far as I'm concerned, and if you look at Job and the wife, it looks like the two were living in the same house, but they were abiding in two different places. One was abiding in God that knows that God will not allow this to happen, that nothing coming out of it. Another one was abiding in a place where he believes that, how, how can God let this happen? Same issue, different perspective. Last week we were talking about perspective. You could be in the same house and you see the thing that's happening to you and your family from a different perspective. Why? Because of where you are standing. And it is important that you abiding is, abiding is not something that you do on a, on a, 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 a daily basis. It's continually. I was talking to Pastor Gideon this morning. I said to Pastor Gideon, I said they have told you They have not told you. They have released a plague. Y'all don't look at me like that. You listen to the news, don't you? Yes. Yes. You look at me like, oh, it's coming closer. It's in Europe now. And they're making us aware that it's going to go all over the place. But the Bible said that no plague shall come near your... Come on, no plague shall come near your... If there is no plague that will come near your dwelling place, you must make sure that your dwelling place is the right place. Amen. And I was saying to Pastor Good, I said that the dwelling place is, is not when you wake up in the morning and you go bow down and pray. No, the dwelling place, because the plague is going around. So your dwelling place, okay, if we say, I said to him, the, the Lord spoke in my spirit that the dwelling place is not location specific. It's not location specific. The dwelling place is with you because he said, I would never help me now. Come on now, I would never. Come on, you're a Bible student. I would never leave you nor forsake you. So if I would never leave you, if I'm with you all the time, that means that your dwelling place will be with me all the time. So it means that if you're with me all the time, whatever come against you would have to come against me. So when these things was happening to Job, what Job it was not privy to, but we are privy to, is because things were happening in the heaven realm that he does, is not aware of. But there was something that he had, a connection with him, that caused him not to allow what was happening down there to taint his view of what God is doing up there. So from the beginning, he has an understanding that God is good. From the beginning, he has an understanding that God is faithful. From the beginning, he has an understanding that God has his best interest at heart. So no matter what the enemy will bring against him, from the beginning, he knows that the worst thing that could ever happen is he dies and go and meet him. We are at an exciting time in our life. People that run, let me say this. When you go to watch a football match, for those of you that watch football, especially when it comes to the final, you expect to go and watch a match for 90 minutes. 
Amen? And then you might end up sitting there for two hours. Or sometimes two hours and 15 minutes. So you can say, you can plan yourself for, for, for 90 minutes. That's what your endurance can keep. After which you pack your things and leave. But if you notice, the coach of the teams recognize when somebody's endurance is sleeping. And they make the call. The intention of them making that call is that the team would win. The difference with yours is you have already won. You didn't get that. I said the difference with yours is you have already won. And because you have already won, all that is needed is for you to be fielded. So once, as long as you are in the field, you will assure of victory. As long as you don't give up, you are assured of victory. Because the victory has already been won. All you are doing is standing the ground and declaring to the enemy that the work that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary was complete. Because when he done, he declared and he said, it is finished. There is nothing added, nothing taken from it. There is no more blood that needs to be shed. So when the enemy comes against us, our faith is to stand and believe that no matter what you do, I refuse to bow to you. Oh, we will go through things. <laughs> oh, my Jesus. We will go through things. But we can declare that thanks be to God. Who always, who always, come on now, it's not sometimes, who always gives us the victory. Hallelujah. Can we talk of endurance? Adversity is going to come staring you in the face. Adversity is going to, because don't forget the adversity is for you to give up your integrity. The adversity is to ensure that you don't, you don't go to the end. The adversity is placed there so that you, it's kind of like something to trip you so that you don't go to the end. Beloved, you cannot have faith without endurance. <laughs> you cannot. Because your faith will be tested. And it is your ability to keep on going, believing God, that what he said concerning you will be bring to pass. That's what holds you. What was holding Job? Because... Job understood that all that he had was not his. He didn't hold it too dear. We need to ask ourselves the things that we own. Are we grabbing it with our two hands? And if the Lord said, leave it, are we going to say, no, I will die here today? Because some people... I've held on to these things and it has caused them to trip and they are no longer able to trust God. The strength of your faith is directly proportional to your ability to endure. If you see all those people that are athletes, you, especially those ones that are They've just run the London Marathon. You hear them tell that there's a part when they are running, they can't feel their foot anymore. But they just keep running because something is at the bottom there that make, makes them move, but they can't feel it anymore. But guess what? They are not moved by how they feel. Looking unto Jesus. Come on now, somebody. The author and finish it off our faith. Looking unto him. Why? They're not looking at what is happening around them here because what is happening around you here is a little distraction to stop you from looking so that you would lose sight of the end. 
And that's why having the right perspective is key. You know Job had a choice. Let me say something. If the wife did said that, why don't you curse God and die? It doesn't appear to be like an unusual request. So Job could have cursed God and died. But he chose not to. And let's look at um, Apostle Paul's. He went through as well. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22. And we'll look through. And then I think we'll close here. Then we'll pick this up again in the afternoon. He said, are they Hebrews? So, are, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labor, listen to, listen to his resume. In labor, more abundant. In stripe, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In death, often. I mean, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and night I have been in the deep. In journeys often. In perils of water. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In the perils of the Gentiles. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. I, I, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and toil. In sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things which comes upon me, come on, help me say that together, daily, daily. <laughs> Yet my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I am not weak, who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation, if I must boast, I will boast in the things which concerns my infirmity. I want you to understand, he just lay out there for you trouble. He just showed you adversity. Do you know some of us will not be able to shipwreck in the deep? Maybe you don't understand. What Go and research what the deep is. In the deep, you are, guy was fasting. The, the fast was not called. It was not because he said, no, it was fasting, fast was not called. Shipwreck. He was beaten. It was counting the number of times he was beaten. If it is us being beaten once, we'll say, ah, ah. It's, what is it? Ah, ah. And I mean beating. So he classified the beatings. He said he was beaten with rods. He was left for death. They stoned him. They thought he's dead. And, in, and, and then people gather him and move him, but still he was continuing to preach. What was pushing him? And then you go to the book of Philippians, you understand what was pushing him. There's one thing he said, I forget the past. And I continue to press him. Why? Because there's a higher calling. Adversity's intention is to stop you from pressing on to the higher call that God has upon your life. Adversity is to hinder you from you being who God wants you to be. But at the same time, it's producing the best in you. Because what the enemy meant for evil, the Lord is turning around and is making to his glory. Beloved, the Bible warns us in 2 Timothy 2 and 3 that you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Some of us don't understand that we are called into this thing as a, as a military personnel. We still believe that we are civilians. They say, no, no, no. Nobody that is in the army mess around with civilian affairs. It's about time we put away our civilian affairs and begin to understand that when it comes, he's not going to be asking you how many houses you had, how many GCSEs you had. When it comes, he's going to be asking you, what did you do with what I gave to you? Second Timothy 2 and 12, it said, if we endure, we also will reign with him. If we deny him, he, will deny, he, will not, he also will deny us. But the reality, but you are watchful in all things, endure affliction and do the work of evangelists and fulfill your ministry. That's Second Timothy 4 and 5. 
It is important that we understand that the things that we are going through is for a moment. I want to say to you, there's a time limit to what you're going through. There's an expiry date to it. You, be t- you might not understand what I'm saying is that 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 to 18, it said, for a light affliction, which is for a moment, there's a limitation to it. It's a moment. A, a moment signifies time. And then there's a reason for it. It's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why we do not look at the things that are seen. Remember what we talked about now. Why we do not look at the things that are seen. Because these are temporary things. We are focusing on the other side. We are focusing on the things which are not seen. Which are eternal. We are focusing on those things. We understand that God has got a better plan for us. He said in Hebrews 12 and 1 to 4. One of you said that you have not resisted yet unto bloodshed, so having against it, you have not. So let us run the race that has been set before us. Amen. Let us run the race with endurance. Stand to your feet. You need endurance in the face of adversity. And I pray that the Lord himself will grant you the wisdom to understand the things that he is doing in your life. You may say that I have reached this far. This is what is happening. And sometimes I want you to notice what, what the enemy did. Strategically, it took away job stuff and then it ended up trying to destroy his body. Is that not what sickness wants to do? To ravage our bodies? Is that not the intention of the enemy? Is to make sure that, all right, if you, it's because you have, you have strength to go to work. You have more, okay. You have money, you won't eat. You have bed, you won't sleep on that bed. I'll make sure that you'll be sleeping in the hospital. Is that not the intention of the enemy? In order for you to compromise your integrity. I want you to grab a hold of your brother and your sister. And you want to pray for them this afternoon, this morning. That Lord, whatever my sister or my brother is going through. We pray that you will give them the strength to be able to go to the end. Because the Bible says that it is he that's endure to the end, they are the one that will be saved. So I want you to pray for your brother and sister that, Lord, give them the grace to go to the end. Give them the grace, O oh God, to endure to the end. O oh Lord, we pray that their testimony, O oh Father, would not be discounted. Their testimony would not be destroyed by the enemy. But we pray that you give them the grace to go to the end. Yes, when the threat of the enemy comes, O oh God, we will see you in it. We know that you are working something greater for us. Greater for us. In the name of Jesus. Father, that's our heart cry this morning. We pray that you would do unusual thing, O oh God. That in the midst of the adversity that is confronting them. In the midst of the adversity that the enemy is throwing their way. You will grant them the understanding, O oh Lord. Spiritual understanding. Spiritual perspective. To act accordingly. So that their voice and their words will align with heaven. And that, Lord, the things that you are doing will be manifest in their life. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' mighty name. Joseph said, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. So we want to see the good that God meant it for to manifest. And it says, do so in your life in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you and God bless you. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. So let the church say amen. Let the church let them say amen. If you believe the word